Welcome to the next in our Tech Talks webinar. And there is no camera, no mic, so I won't be able to tell if you're paying attention, uh, but you'll know, and that's what really matters. So instead of using the chat feature, like most of you already just did, uh, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions. If we have time at the end of the presentation, we will get to those. If not, we will answer all Q&A questions in writing, and those answers will be sent out to all registrants along with a PDH certificate for the attendees and a link to the YouTube channel with the recorded webinar. So you can share that with some coworkers. But even better than that is to contact me directly and schedule a live Zoom meeting with your company. And then you will have uh, Mr. David Batts and myself at your disposal to interact and ask questions. Those are really, really effective. So I'm gonna get into my next slide here and start introducing our company. And we will respect your time and get this done uh, right at an hour. Uh, for those of you that have attended all of our tech talks, we do the same intro with four slides just to make sure people know who we are. I am Bill Murphy, the civil engineer for ASP Enterprises, Quick Supply Company, Bowman Construction Supply, and Cascade Geosynthetics. And all of those businesses have uh, a lot of experience, and we won't tell you how many years each person has, uh, but we have a whole lot of experience wrapped up. At our annual sales meeting, we have everyone in the company go around, and this, it'll be virtual this year go around and say how many years they've been in the industry and we total those up and it's an impressive number. Uh, we do have a number of CPESs on the staff. I think it's more than five now, one engineer, and we have well over 12,000 customers now to need to update that slide. Map of the U.S. shows our presence um, where we are predominantly located, but we're blessed to be part of a VAR network with David Batts and his company and several others where if you have a question and you live in one of these areas and your project's in one of these areas, we will certainly help you. But if you have a question for a project that's outside of these areas shown on the map, we can still help you. We can point you to folks like David Batts and Construction Eco Services for Texas and surrounding areas. And we have friends like that across the United States and beyond who do a lot of what we do. What do we do? We provide a lot of construction site solutions and some of you know us real well from being in the vegetation and erosion and sediment control business. Uh, we've grown over the last six years in stormwater management. That's where I specialize. Uh, all of our branches carry geosynthetics and we have warehouses full of rolled products and other uh, commodities that you need on a regular basis in addition to a lot of engineered products. And we have hardscapes at a number of our locations, but not all of them yet. And there's even some other things that are a little bit obscure that may not fit in any of those, such as uh, some of the other products we use in roadways or some other treatment systems. But if you don't know, if we carry it, call and ask. And if it's something that is new to the industry and you're not very aware of it, we might be. We just may not have it advertised on our website yet. But we do. We are blessed with a lot of large warehouses and big yards. And in order to operate those, we need a lot of trucks. Oh, I got rid of that next slide. Has a lot of trucks, straight trucks, semis, um, small trucks, even our sales folks, most of them drive pickup trucks. And uh, everybody's busy. We're all in the business of providing solutions when you need them, where you need them. And if when in doubt, like I say, give us a call and we can package up some pretty special deals where instead of you buying a truckload of one thing, we put everything on one truck. Uh, contact information, you can find it on our website, asp.ent, point you to all of those and they all end up in about the same place. Uh, I've gone as long as I like to go, four to five minutes. So I want to introduce our speaker. I call him Dr. David Batts. He's not a doctor, but I think it sounds really cool with his name. David Batts is lead in AP. He's with Construction Eco Services. They are a full service stormwater company focused on bringing innovative solutions to the Texas market and surrounding areas. And they focus on all aspects of stormwater, construction phase, stormwater pollution prevention, post-construction maintenance for property owners and engineered specified products. And they're uniquely positioned to take care of a vast array of stormwater needs across the uh, South Central states. David grew up in, on the Texas golf course and he spent every free moment on the water. He uh, cares a lot about the environment and it's fitting that he became a professional to help protect that ecosystem that he enjoyed throughout his life. And promoting innovative new water management strategies is his passion and in addition to how he makes a living. And he helps people like us um, not only network with other people like us, but to continue to push ourselves to keep up with innovation. And that's what he's gonna do for us here today but he is recognized as an expert in green infrastructure design and construction methods. And he's been with construction eco services since 2006. And he was the first employee they had in their stormwater system solutions business unit. And he now runs that. 
avid fisherman conservationist and a blessed husband of his beautiful wife and three boys. And with that, David, I'll hand the keys over to you. Let me go up here. Remote control. Awesome. And you click on that and you should be driving, buddy. Oh, let's see. Can you hear me okay? You sound wonderful. All right. All right. There you go. Know. There we go. All right. So um, thank you guys. And uh, <laughs> Bill, I grew up on the Texas Gulf Coast, not the golf course. Really close, really close. Um, I hit as many golf balls in the water as I, uh, I spend on the water. So I try to stay off. I was golf. cracking up, but I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so this, this presentation has been one I've been doing for quite a bit in, in the Texas area. It's called From Gray to Green to Smart. And uh, if you guys were paying attention last, uh, last month, I actually got published in Stormwater Magazine. I was kind of their, their lead article, which is really cool. I didn't expect to get to be the lead article when they asked me to, to uh, write an article. So if you want to see a little bit more on it and kind of what we're doing in Texas and some other places around the country, feel free to check out that, uh, that article in the October issue. So kind of jumping in, uh, I guess, head first, you know, let's look a little bit at the history of, of gray infrastructure. We all use it. We all know what it is. We're all familiar with it. It's the out of sight, out of mind method of water conveyance. And, you know, the act of moving water isn't anything new. It's actually intentional movement of water in, uh, in these, these channels is, is well over 6,000 years old. And it goes all the way back to uh, surface-based storm drains uh, found in Babylonian and Mesopotamian uh, empires, so 4,000 to 2,500 BC. And what these were were primarily uh, just kind of U-shaped surface drains, as you can see in the picture of the right. These were combined sewers, so you had storm, you had sanitary, but the idea was to get water, wastewater and storm water, away from the wealthy parts of towns, the places where the religious centers were, where the, uh, the elite lived, where the palaces were, and move it towards the people that, uh, that uh, you know, deserved that kind of treatment, right? Uh, that were at the bottom of the hill, at the bottom of the watershed, not the top of the watershed. Uh, not a whole lot unlike what we do today, uh, in fact. So throughout the years, throughout this time, uh, Things started to improve. They started coming up with more, I guess, innovative ways, if you will. Uh, back 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago in 3000 BC, uh, they started to move to clay pipes. Uh, they started putting it underground, uh, out of sight of the mine, hiding it uh, from public view, especially where uh, the elite lived and where these um, religious centers were. And it wasn't really until the Romans got a hold of it did large advancements start to get made in the conveyance of mass amounts of raw sewage as well as stormwater and making sure that it was well hidden underground and, uh, and, and moved away from the centers. The challenge became, and it was, it was really kind of a, a, a dormant period, but oh, one of the other interesting things that you might not know is the Greeks actually had a goddess of the sewer. Her name was uh, Cloacina, and it basically meant the goddess of cleansing. Um, then when the Roman Empire fell, the world kind of went into chaos. And when you're fighting wars and you're, you're starving, I guess, uh, I guess sanitation kind of goes out the window, uh, literally. And people would just dump pails of, uh, uh, <laughs> of all kinds of nasty stuff right out the window onto the streets. And that's kind of how the world sat for, uh, for, for hundreds of years until the mid 19th century did uh, things begin to improve again. And it really came down to and this screen movement is slow. Or might be a bit of a lag. I'm on a gravel road in Iowa. Ah, uh, that's right. <laughs> I forget that you live in Iowa. <laughs> yeah, I say southern Iowa, but most people that aren't from Iowa say there's a southern Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And true. Um, well, let me see if I can get back on track here. If I didn't hit the button too many times. So basically, in the mid 1850s, um, there was a there was a uh, there was a guy that basically said, "Hey, why don't we separate storm sewer from sanitary sewer?" And, and with that, uh, yeah, here's his name, Edwin Chadwick, in 1842, uh, had the suggestion, and 
it, it was the first time we started to see the separation of, of stormwater and sanitary. Now, most of you, if, if you guys have combined sewer overflow issues or you're dealing with combined sewers, you can see this has started in 1842. So if you go back and look at how old your city is, uh, there's a good chance that those those combined sewers were installed uh, before this or that, that that planning was done well before this and we're just kind of stuck with, uh, with it uh, from there on out. So that was kind of the, the birth of, of modern uh, separation of storm and sanitary. Yeah, this thing's slow. Yeah, there's quite a lag. I can hear you click and I'm, I'm monitoring on my computer and phone. Yeah. So it's advancing, but it's about a 12 second delay, which is the longest I've ever had. Pretty good. So I'll start clicking like 12 seconds before I'm ready for the next slide. We'll see. Yeah, if, if that throws you off, good. we can switch it over to you can share your screen if you'd no, rather. Okay. I'm fine with no, that. We're, we're, we're good. All right. Um, so modern day gray infrastructure, you know, the 20th century was all about separating these systems. But as you can see, the technology is the same. There's nothing really a lot different from what the Romans did and what we do. Uh, I mean, the curb, you can, you can go to um, uh, Pompeii and you can see curb and gutter systems that look almost identical to ours. So, you know, why hasn't the technology and the ideology changed in this country or, or across the world as it relates to the way we convey uh, water or the way specifically we convey stormwater? Um, because one of the things that we're, we realize, and if you look at it, the way we convey water is the big challenge is, is the faster we convey it, the more densely populated we become, the greater the challenge becomes downstream uh, as we continue to move water uh, quickly through pipes, through culverts. Um, you know, the, the solution oftentimes becomes these large regional detention ponds uh, that are having, they're eating up mass, uh, uh, real estate that would be available for, you know, densification. So as areas like Houston, uh, Kansas City, St. Louis, the, anywhere in the Midwest, as they grow, they get bigger, they get more densely populated, uh, we're only speeding up uh, the, the rate at which water moves. And if you go back and look at population density, when the ancient Romans kind of perfected this idea, there were only 41 people per square mile. If you look at a place like Houston, there's 3,600 people per square mile. So imagine the additional impervious cover that's required to move water and move people uh, that was not in place during the ancient Roman Empire. Um, most of my examples come from Houston because that's where I'm from. Also, that tends to be the only time Houston makes the news is when there's a flood. Uh, so I get to talk a lot about flooding, but here's a hydrograph from a couple of our watersheds during uh, Tropical Storm Allison, which really started to change a lot of the rules and regulations as it related to stormwater detention and conveyance in the Houston area. But you can see pre-development flows versus today flows uh, or, or post-development flows for these two watersheds. And you can see the, the blue line is uh, what would have happened what, or what did happen during Tropical Storm Allison. The peak flows reached up around 34,000 cubic feet per second. Whereas had it been 1915 pre-development, those flows would have never reached more than 8,000 cubic feet per second. So there's almost a three times increase in rate at which water moves out of the watershed and, in, and into, or out off of the watershed and into the creeks and bayous. And what that does is it creates flash flooding. Um, not to say that Houston didn't flood prior to 1950. And I got some great photographs of uh, people waiting around downtown Houston in the water uh, in 1913. But the amount of water and the, the, the amount of water going in the creeks today is just far more and far faster than they ever were before. And that's because of the amount of the, the density of the population and uh, what it takes to move that density of, of people and house that density of people. So Tropical Storm Allison comes, flood the entire city, floods one of our most valuable resources, the Houston Medical Center. Um, several floors of the Med Center were underwater, billions of dollars worth of damage, and people start thinking, well, maybe we should do something different. The knee-jerk response that oftentimes happens in places where flooding is common is, well, let's just put detention ponds in. Let's, let's run the water off of the impervious area in these larger lakes and detention ponds. Let's hold that water. Let's pay it out in a restricted flow. And then we'll let it all go downstream at the same time. The problem is in most areas, those restrictors are all sized about the same. And then all the flows in the creeks rise and fall at the exact same elevation every storm. And you end up with stream bank erosion. You end up with other issues downstream. Aside from that, 
you lose a lot of density. So now if sprawl is an issue in your uh, community, now you're putting these detention ponds in that's requiring sometimes 30% more land to build the same amount of houses. So your density starts to increase. Um, the efficiency starts to increase. The value of the curb and gutter system starts to increase. Because at some point, we moved away from standard uh, ditches, like you see in much of, uh, of suburban areas, but we moved away from ditches and we went to curb and gutter systems, much like the, uh, the Romans used to convey water. And that conveyance, that, that increase in speed is what re re resulted in these, um, these detention ponds. So about 20 years ago, shoot, maybe even 30 years ago now, in the early, early 90s, mid 90s, um, an idea started to emerge from places like the Chesapeake Bay, from Australia with their, their uh, water sense of urban design movement, this idea of what if instead of moving the water off of our property, we kept the water on our property. And if any of you guys live in, uh, in rural area, very uh, uh, rural areas like I grew up, uh, around rice fields, around corn fields, you know, the goal of the farmer was never to move the water off his property. It was to retain the water on his property. And in fact, in my hometown, I remember going to church on Sundays after a long drought and they would pray for rain. Not so they can move it into the into the creeks and into the Gulf of Mexico, but so that they could retain it and they could they could irrigate their crops. So the green movement really isn't nothing more than the farmers' movement. It's it's taking the water and instead of disposing of it as fast as possible, allowing it to soak into your property or keep it on your individual lot as long as possible. So instead of regional ponds or neighborhood ponds, maybe you have. Um, Maybe you have a pond on each block, or maybe you have a pond in front of you, in front of your yard. And so the screen movement take, took a different approach. So instead of letting the water move away from your property as fast as possible, so we saw these drastic three times peaks in, in flow, keep the water on your property as long as possible. And that allows us to extend that time of concentration and decrease those peak flows. So as we get into design strategy, really all we're doing is going back to the way a lot of rural areas are already built which are ditches. If you look at many of the old, uh, the original towns that make up Houston today, uh, many of them were built with ditches in the, uh, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. The reason was, was because it was cheap back then. Um, real estate was cheap back then. As real estate prices got higher, it became cheaper to do curb and gutter because you could create more density. And then as curb and gutter created more downstream problems, you had to put these detention ponds in and you completely lost the density that you originally had gotten. So why not just go back to ditches? They're less expensive than curb and gutter. Now, we don't call them ditches anymore. We call them bioswales, we call them rain gardens. We're trying to get water quality benefits out of it. We're trying to slow the water down and not just convey it. Um, this is a neighborhood that we did on 80 acres in Houston, in um, used to, what used to be farmland, uh, rice fields. Uh, we capped them, we, did, we dug bioswales, as you can kind of see these circular drives, these have large park space like bioswales. And we basically held, treated and conveyed the 100 year flood with a 40% reduction in overall detention. And uh, this is what they look like uh, on a normal day. So the goal with, uh, with these systems is to basically pull that peak flow down. So the yellow line you see here is a hydrograph for a seven acre apartment complex uh, for a hundred year storm. In Houston, everything we have to do is, is centered around the hundred year storm. A lot of low impact development that you'll listen to, a lot of talks you'll listen to, it's all about the water quality volume. It's all about that first inch or two. In Houston, we're managing the hundred year storm. We're only treating the first inch or two, but we're managing the hundred year storm within these systems. Um, so we're, and, and our hundred year storm is, a, is 16 and a half inch, 24 hour uh, per the latest from Atlas 14, just to kind of give you a, an idea of, of what a hundred year storm in Houston is. It's, it's a lot of water. So the yellow line that you see here is a traditional seven acre apartment complex, what the runoff is, what that, uh, what that time of concentration is and what those peak flows look like. So it's about 45 cubic feet per second would come off of this development. The pre-development flows uh, you can see in the pink line is about 12 cubic feet per second. So most of our land sits on clay. So I'm sure much of the Midwest also sits on clay, right? Uh, so 
generally you have about a foot of topsoil that's going to absorb water. And then even then, I mean, we're flat too. So we have that going against us. Uh, then water is going to start running over the curb. What we're trying to do with low impact development is we're trying to extend that time of concentration in the built environment so that our peak flows do not exceed our pre-development flows. You can see in the blue line in this design, we're actually able to stretch that hydrograph out enough with the use of permeable pavers and bioswales uh, that we could get the peak flow uh, no greater than eight cubic feet per second, which was a drastic decrease from what traditional design looked like. The result generally is a decrease in detention volume, overall detention volume needed. And we're doing this in spaces that we would already be losing due to landscape uh, requirements or parking requirements, those sorts of things. So we're using them, we're doing it in permeable pavers, we're doing it in, uh, in, in landscape bioswales that can be anywhere between 12 inches and up to five feet deep. So this is a rat. This is a squirrel. Tree rat. Anybody know the difference between a rat and a squirrel? Bill, you know the difference between a rat and a squirrel? No. Fuzzy tail, right? Yeah, so one's cute. <laughs> yeah, one's cute, right? One's got a better PR department. <laughs> so what's the difference between a ditch and a bioswale? Better name. Fuzzy, fuzzy or tail, right? It's the fuzzy same tail. thing. Like from, a, from, a, from an engineering perspective, I mean, it's the same thing. You're, you're basically designing a earthen swale to convey water. Nobody wants a ditch in their front yard. Everybody likes bioswales, rain gardens, you know, but it's all the same thing, uh, same concept, same way of engineering. We may add some engineered soils, we may add some native plants, we may add some other features to make it an enhanced ditch, make it a better ditch. But in the end, when it comes to calculating volume and flows, it's nothing more than a ditch. And the modeling that goes into it, depending on it, whether you're using HECRAS or you're using EPA SWIM or any of the other modeling software is essentially you're just modeling a ditch and you might have some restrictors in there. You may have some weirs in there. You may have some gabions in there to slow the flows. But at the end of the day, we're just modeling a ditch. And once we can get our mind around that, we can really understand how extending time of concentration with low impact development helps us help our clients in the development community um, make more of their land. And essentially that's what we wanna do. We wanna help the development community make more of their land so that we don't end up with more sprawl. We can, we can, get, we can create tightly dense uh, neighborhoods uh, and ponds aren't working against us, they're actually working for us. So this is a project we just finished up. Actually, I'm trying to drop a, a video on this right now uh, on, on, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, we're getting it put together because I went to this site five times for five consecutive days during Tropical Storm Beta. It got about 10 inches of rainfall on it over those uh, over those five days. So I wanted to come see and, and document how they were working. So be looking for that pretty soon. But we've got a 7-Eleven on the corner. We've got a Shipley's Donuts. With, if you're not from Texas and you've never had a <laughs> Shipley's Donut, you need to just hop on the plane, fly down here and get a Shipley's Donut. Uh, but in the back, we've got um, we've got apartment complexes. And this particular project, we were able to give this developer 24 additional units and we were able to give the retail side an extra pad by eliminating this pond that you see back here in, uh, in orange. So the design we actually came up with was we took all the green space available on this project and we basically created storage out of it. So it was landscaping that was already there. The landscaping was gonna sit, sit on a six inch curb and instead of allowing it to six, sit six inches above the pavement, we depressed it and drained the pavement to it and we forced the water to go into the landscaping instead of away from the landscaping. I mean, here's a novel idea. Think about this, plants like water. I mean, it's, who knew, right? So the, just the mere fact that for, you know, a thousand years we've run our water away from our plants makes absolutely no sense. So this is just a different way of, of taking real estate that was already allocated as landscaping and turn it into dual use multifunctional landscaping that now I'm using for conveyance. So I don't have any pipe on this side or very little. And if the pipe I do have is really small, I have very few inlets. They're just overflows in the landscape beds. And my, my detention, most of my detention is met in the landscaping. I'm already giving up as a real estate anyway. And I'm getting all my water re uh, quality requirements because with these biofilters, I'm removing uh, up to 90% of my total suspended solids. So this is what it uh, looks like today. 
they're still in construction. You can see in the, the back left over here, they're still building the apartment units. And one of the things that we were able to do is this, you can see this oak tree over here to the left. We were able to save that oak tree. It was a 40, or I'm sorry, a 50 year old uh, uh, grandfather oak tree. Uh, it's super old, huge diameter, really valuable tree, great uh, tree for uh, people that live in the apartments. And we were able to turn this into a wet bottom pond. This is kind of neat. When this pond fills up, it actually overflows into a biofiltration area uh, down here in this bottom left-hand corner where you can see that silt sack right next to that is, is, is one of the biofilters. So another, another project, this one's got a little bit longer term success. We finished this one in 2013 and it, it fits more of an urban setting. Uh, this is Bagby Street in Midtown. Uh, this is a quote from Marlon Marshall who, Marshall, who is the Director of Engineering and Construction for the Midtown Re Redevelopment Authority. So during Memorial Day, Tax Day and Hurricane Harvey floods, Bagby Street outperformed every street in the Midtown District. Um, that being said, if you've ever been in the Midtown District during a storm, almost every other street floods. So it's not saying a lot. It's just saying that this street worked and the others didn't. Uh, we're actually in the process of uh, doing a few other streets in the same district uh, using the same uh, technologies. This is kind of a timeline of the project. We started design in 2010, construction in 2012, um, construction completed in 2000, late 2013. And we maintained the biofilters on this project from 13 to 14. And then they went unmaintained for five years. Nobody touched them. Um, so most of the time you would think that's going to be death for any type of stormwater quality treatment device or biofiltration system or permeable pavement. So after five years, we were able to get Marlin to sign a maintenance contract and hire us to start maintaining the systems. And what we do on, on these biofilters is we want to test the biofilter to make sure it's functioning before we go into a full maintenance regime. So you can see in this bottom right hand picture, uh, that is a hydraulic conductivity tester. It's not a giant bong mill. Uh, it's a hydraulic conductivity tester. And what that does is it, fill, it pushes water through the filter and tells us what the flow rate through that soil is. So we know whether or not we need to remove the soil and replace it so that we're getting optimal performance. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on that in a bit. During Hurricane Harvey, this site actually had 200 year storm hits it, hit it. It had uh, over 16 inches of rainfall uh, on two consecutive days, which was pretty impressive. Uh, you can see the high water mark in these biofilters never reached, uh, just barely reached the sidewalks. As far as the testing goes, when we came back five years after to test these systems in 2019, uh, you can see every single one of them passed the test. Uh, some of them passed it in less than six minutes. And basically what they had to do is they had to pass five feet of water in a, uh, in a hydraulic conductivity test. So um, really, really good results uh, was, hope, was what we hoped for, but really didn't expect all of them uh, to pass. Uh, you can see they're all kind of passed at a different rate. That's just the nature of, of dealing with nature as opposed to something like a six inch pipe. Uh, it's a little more predictable, but um, it all fell within the range that we like to see, which with, with the biofiltration medias that we use, uh, we're typically looking at between uh, uh, 100 and 140 inches an hour uh, infiltration rate. So why was this project so successful? There was a couple of things that the designers did to set themselves up for success. One was that they used sediment four bays. Uh, for pretreatment prior to discharge into the biofiltration area. So you can see uh, outside the biofilters uh, in the red area is the four bays. So the water comes in these four bays and allows as much water to infiltrate as possible. They used um, some water loving plants, uh, some cypress trees to just absorb a ton of water. Uh, but the sediment, a lot, of the, a lot of the sediment settles out before it hits the filter. Then you can see we've got V-notch weirs uh, that allow the water to slowly make its way into the biofilters. Again, creating residence time and settling time outside of the filters. That way the filters are really focused on sediment, but, but primarily focused on nitrogen and phosphorus and heavy metals and some of the other pollutants that uh, simply uh, allowing residence time in the four bays isn't going to remove. And then what we used was uh, the focal point high performance modular bioretention systems to treat the water and remove um, the, the remaining pollutants that are out of the system. And what that does in that treatment train approach is it, it, it takes care and it, it prolongs the life of your, uh, your, your, your more um, sensitive uh, filter, if you will. 
So that kind of gets us off of the green stuff. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard a million presentations on that anyway, and gets us moving towards smart, which, you know, when I started 15 years ago, the, the big new thing was green infrastructure. And we've been talking about it for 15 years, like it's big and new. Uh, it's not big and new anymore. It's been around for 30 years. Uh, most technology, if it's around for 30 years, it's obsolete. Uh, so, you know, it's time to start moving on to the next thing. Uh, the next thing is smart technology uh, as it relates to stormwater management. And I think you're starting to see a lot of companies crop up uh, around the country looking at innovative solutions to basically to take care of this smart market, if you will. Um, the reality is, is just about everything we own is now controlled uh, through technology, through your phone. Uh, I know my house is, uh, I can change my thermostat. I'm actually in San Antonio today. So I wish somebody would have guessed San Antonio because they would have been the real winner today. Uh, <laughs> we're putting in, uh, we're actually working with the San Antonio River Authority doing a demonstration project uh, with some of our high flow medias that they're going to test for us for a, uh, uh, for a year or so just to see how they perform. Uh, we've tested in a lot of other places, but you know, you know how it is. If you don't test it in your own backyard, then it doesn't work. Um, same thing with smart technology, right? If you don't test it in your backyard, it doesn't really work. So uh, we're just getting out on the, these, these smart valves and smart weirs. But the reality is the smart technology has been around for 20 years as well. We're just now getting it into uh, stormwater. So a lot of people trust their locks. They trust their thermostats. They trust their home security to the smart technology. And even if you're one of those holdouts and you're not one of those that, uh, that want to trust your home to, to smart technology because you're afraid the Russians are going to hack. Actually, I'm married to a Russian, so I don't have to worry about it. I have a deal with the Russians. They won't hack my house. They'll just hack yours. Um, we have been using this type of technology to call 911 uh, in case of an emergency for a really long time. Everybody remembers Rescue 911 from the 90s and early aughts. Um, no, we're fully confident that if we call 911, an ambulance is going to show up somewhere in the next five to five hours, five minutes, to five hours. Uh, so again, we rely on this type of technology every single day. There's no reason why we shouldn't start to rely on it as it relates to stormwater management. In fact, the EPA put out a document two years ago. Again, this is two years ago. This isn't yesterday. This is two years ago called Smart Data Infrastructure for Wet Weather Control and Decision Support that focuses on on how the stormwater management industry is going to move into the future with, uh, with wet weather control uh, in real time uh, data. They've even put out some, uh, this is actually in Pennsylvania, these smart green corridors where, you know, lo and behold, what are they using? They're using GI by retention in green streets and they're using smart stormwater ponds and smart ponds. So again, most of this stuff is already, it's being stolen from the wastewater industry that you see over here on the left-hand side. Uh, wastewater treatment facilities have been doing this for decades. Uh, again, nothing new. It's just we're adapting technology that already exists. It's starting to get cheap enough that it makes sense to use in the stormwater marketplace. Some of the projects that we've worked on, this is one of the first ones. We did this with a, a group out of Boston called OptiRTC. A uh, really neat, innovative prod, uh, product. Uh, this was a, a corporate center where we were trying to get lead points for a project. And they had already designed a 60,000 cubic foot underground detention system. And because they were seeking lead points, they wanted to, to create a dual use rainwater harvesting and detention system. The problem is, is that most jurisdictions are not comfortable counting harvested rainwater as detention because it could have rained yesterday, filled up your harvesting system. You haven't had time to irrigate and two days later another big storm comes and you you lose volume so what we had to do is we had to convince the city that we could uh, use automated controls to free the volume ahead of the storm so one of the things that opti does is they uh, they they have technology that reads weather reports ahead of a storm coming uh, they calculate how much water is predicted to fall and they release that amount of water out of the harvesting system prior to the storm coming. So when the storm does come, it refills the harvesting system. And uh, then there's additional capacity uh, available after the fact. So here you can see our, our, uh, our vault. You can see the water line. Our harvested water was only about a third of our total volume. So even if the technology got it wrong, there was still detention capacity. Uh, the only way it would really impact is if it was a hundred year storm or larger, if the, uh, if the, if the technology failed. Uh, one of the other things is most of these technologies are designed to fail open anyway. So if it did fail, it would just open the valve and release your harvested water uh, until somebody came out and repaired the, the failure. 
Well, here you can see plan view with the box culverts and the, uh, the, the weir structure uh, that we used for the valve. Kind of give you an idea of cost. Uh, this project actually saved the, the end user $9,600 a year on potable water. Uh, it cost, the, the upfront cost of the system was about $55,000. So they had about a five year return on investment, uh, which is pretty fast for a rainwater harvesting system. A lot of times you see in 10 and 20 year returns on uh, rainwater harvesting. Uh, this was a way to shorten that pretty drastically. So one of the things that we learned pretty early on and why technology is so great, how many of your best management practices that you installed tell you when there's something wrong? No, you have to wait until an inspector goes out there once every year or never, and then you know something's wrong. Or the public complains because it's holding water. Well, in an underground vault, nobody would ever know it was holding water until water starts bubbling out of the inlets. So in this particular project, we had a rainwater harvesting system. Um, the contractor put the hole through the weir wall in the wrong place, so he moved it. He forgot to cover the hole. So we were getting readings on our detention system where water would come into the basin, it would fill the basin and the water would just draw down without the irrigation system hooking up, uh, 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 kicking on. So we ask ourselves, okay, what's going on here? We go down there and we see a big hole in the weir wall. Contractor fixes it, the problem's fixed. How long would have that gone on if there wasn't a transducer in the bottom of this basin telling us that there was something wrong with the system? That's really the value of automation and innovation and stormwater management in this manner is that we know how these BMPs are performing in real time. We don't have to wait on an inspector to go out there. So this is how it should work. Uh, the green area is the volume inside of, a, inside of the cistern. The black uh, line is the total volume of the system uh, that's in the system. And then the red shaded area is the forecast. That's forecast how much water is going to come into the basin. So you can see once the forecast said there was rain, it started to drop the water in the system on the black line. And then you can see the black line started to raise as the forecasted rain actually hit the impervious area and made its way into the system. So that's how these things are supposed to work. A uh, little visual res uh, representation. So what else can automation do? So it makes it really cool for uh, rainwater harvesting systems or watershed management. But there's some other things it can do for us. So the, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality in my state did, uh, did some analysis. Uh, the University of Texas did a study on what they call batch detention basins. And what a batch detention basin is, is it's a, it's a small basin that's either combined with your detention volume or an offset of your detention uh, volume that captures your water quality volume. And when the water comes, it starts to come into that water quality basin, a transducer triggers a valve to shut and hold the water for 12 hours, creating a temporary settling basin. That creates a 91% TSS removal um, just in that, that short 12 hour period of, uh, of settling. And then after the 12 hours is up, it opens the valve and it releases the water downstream, leaving the, uh, the sediment uh, in place. And you can see this is a, uh, this is a chart that shows uh, extended detention compared to a Austin sand filter uh, compared to our smart pond. Pond three is our smart pond. The Caltrans is an extended detention basin and the Austin sand filter is a sand filter. And you can see our pollutant removal of TSS is up in the 91% where Caltrans is at 72% with their extended detention basin and the Austin sand filter is at 90%. So it's actually more effective uh, than the Austin sand filters which they pretty much are exclusively used in that region. So the value in this is really compared to sand filters or some other large um, stormwater quality basins is really in its efficiency because we can, um, we can eliminate a lot of structures that go into some of these other designs, especially uh, sand filtration, because we're just dealing with the volume inside of the pond itself. So this is kind of, this is one of our answers. Um, this was actually developed by some, some friends, some farmers in the Mississippi Delta that manage uh, crops on farms. If you guys are familiar with uh, how farms are constructed or you ever worked on a farm, they have what are called flashboard risers uh, that are basically just stacked boards uh, that have to go out and be cut out after big storms. Uh, the reason for these stacked boards is to keep the nutrients on the farm as opposed to flushing them uh, downstream and ultimately a lot of times into the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico. 
Um, so what these guys realized was they were tired of uh, driving two hours to their farm to cut these flashboard risers. Wouldn't it be cool if they could develop an automated control? Uh, they found me at a, uh, at a conference and we got to talking and uh, I knew that there was, there was a lot of room in the marketplace for, for this type of technology. But the thing that was really interesting to me as I was trying to come up with solutions for this batch detention requirement was that this actually releases water off the surface and not from the bottom, which means you'd get a higher retention. It's basically imagine a 24 inch by 24 inch catch basin on a swivel that acts like a fair cloth skimmer, but completely automated. Uh, these guys were just using it for farms and duck, duck ponds. And, and we started looking at ways to use it, um, use it inside uh, stormwater applications. So here you can see some of the command features. Uh, it's all app controlled, or you can do pre-programmed logic. So we've got a pre-programmed to perform that batch detention function, but you can also get on your phone and move uh, these units, you know, from anywhere in the world, uh, just from a simple app. Here's one of the first installs we did. This is a Big Sky Ranch. This is a, uh, a couple hundred acre development in uh, Dripping Springs. If you had Dripping Springs Vodka, uh, that's where uh, this is this is uh, taking place. You can see the, the larger weir wall that's designed to handle the 100 year, uh, but our weir is simply there to handle the water quality volume, which is about the first inch and a half on this particular project. So this project has, uh, the first phase has three ponds. You can get a general idea what the plan section looks like in these weirs. And this is uh, basically what's going on. So this is, uh, this is from uh, a pond that we were, we were manipulating out in the Mississippi Delta. I've got some new data from some of the ponds that we're working uh, in the Austin area. I need to update this, this presentation, but you can see the gate level is at 30 inches. You can see the water level starts out at about 19 inches and then the green line is your battery level. So we're always monitoring battery. So the storm comes, it fills the pond, uh, it holds the water for 12 hours and then we rotate over uh, about 48 hours until the basin's empty. We let it sit there for a bit until the next storm comes, transducer senses water, we raise the gate back up, hold it until the pond fills and then re repeat the process. And this does this command forever until you tell it to do something else. And that's kind of the neat thing about these types of technologies. You know, if you put in a biofilter, you put in a uh, hydrodynamic separator or some other sort of water quality treatment device, and it doesn't work, you have to completely rip it out and start over. With this technology, if we realize that residency time is a better pollutant removal at 24 hours, we just change the code. Or if we say we're effective at six hours, we just change the code. Or if we want the drawdown to go over 120 hours, we just change the command. Uh, or if a large storm's coming, say Hurricane Harvey's coming, and we don't want to let that water go downstream, we can override the, the controls and say, I want you to hold this water until I tell you not to. And it'll hold that water for weeks if you want it to hold the water for weeks. So it really allows us to manipulate the amount of water that's coming off of any type of development in a way that, uh, that we just haven't had in the past. Everything before this has been passive. Uh, the other thing, you know, a lot of a lot of people ask me about cold weather climate with these rotary weirs and if there's issues. Um, we've kind of we've addressed that by coming up with a valve version that we can bury. You could also put that in an underground vault, the rotary weir, but it might get a little expensive because it's it's a large apparatus. You'd have to have at least a five by five vault, if not bigger, to make it work. Uh, but it is something you can make work. Uh, something that would be a little bit less expensive is uh, is using a valve. And we were running into this a lot where you've got topography uh, like in Austin, uh, Central Texas area where they build walls to compound uh, water. Uh, so we put a valve on the back side of the wall um, to hold it back. And this is giving an idea what these details look like here. Um, one of the other things we're asking ourselves is, you know, a place like Houston, if you guys watch the news during Hurricane Harvey, one, it was a little sensationalized. It wasn't quite as bad as, uh, as everybody portrayed, but it wasn't a walk in the park either. It was a lot of people lost their homes. Uh, I think I think Bill even drove down almost to my hometown, a little town called Alvin, and, yep. uh, and helped out quite a bit down there. Um, I think he got bit by a lot of ants more than anything. And fire ants. <laughs> yeah, fire ants and mosquitoes is what we're best, best at. <laughs> but one of the things that we've been asking uh, in our watershed, because what happened was the attics in the Barker Reservoir overtopped and were breached. And these reservoirs were built prior to World War 
II. There was a plan for a third reservoir, but then World War II took all the resources, and so they just got the two built. Had the third reservoir been there, we wouldn't have had nearly the damage downstream that, that was had. So now there's talk of building a third reservoir, but there's been sprawl where the third reservoir would be. So they'd have to put it all the way out in kind of this Rosenberg area that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. Well, this, this region has been, this region in orange and the upstream of the Attics and, and Barker Reservoir has been one of, one of the most uh, highly developed areas in Houston. It's got massive detention ponds. So imagine if we could take those existing detention ponds, put automated controls on them, and just keep the water out of the Attics and Barker until everything downstream had cleared and then phase the release of water as those reservoirs can handle it. The reality is, is there's enough volume in the detention ponds and private development and public development in the, in the upstream that we could make enough volume to equal a third reservoir. So those are some of the things we're looking at uh, uh, as how to deal with these issues uh, in places like Houston where you get uh, substantial rainfall. One of the other things we're doing is we're uh, looking at uh, how can we infiltrate water faster. So as I mentioned earlier, Harris County sits on, or Houston area, most of Texas sit on a big pan of hard clay. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to get water back into those clays faster. Uh, so this is a study that we're working on right now where we're using the smart pond to try to keep water inside of this basin uh, so that we can test some uh, different uh, uh, apparatuses. So the really cool about, thing about this project is that we did a green road on Holdreth Road here. Uh, this is a new maintenance facility where we did permeable pavers using uh, a paved drain and, uh, and bioswales. And then we used, um, we used a smart pond and we used something called EGRP, I'll, I'll tell you about briefly, in the pond to try to increase the infiltration rate of the, uh, of the soils. So here you can see we did uh, bioswales, rainwater harvesting. This is actually a zero discharge pr uh, project where we don't let any of the water go. Uh, we, we either reuse it or try to infiltrate as much as possible. Here you can see the bioswales with the biofilter. The biofilters I was telling you guys about earlier, those focal points, they sit right here. That's one of the values of these high flow rate medias is that they're really small, easy to maintain, and really fast to, to build. Uh, here you can see the, the pavers. Again, we didn't do the entire parking lot. We, we calculated that we could actually get the volume through the pavers we needed just by doing a strip and then expanding our rock out underneath the concrete, help us save cost on the project. And this is our harvesting pond. Uh, we had bioswales along the roadways. And so again, the same concept, we took a, a center median that's typically raised on six inches and we, where you'd normally buy a detention pond in a right of way somewhere. And we just created detention and uh, attenuation right there in the median that we already had. So it's just a better use of space. I love that so much more than the raised berms we have on a lot of boulevards that they have to run city water, you know, treated drinking water to irrigate plants. Yeah, just run the water to it. No, I mean, it's not that hard of a concept, right? <laughs> I love it. Uh, and then this is our infiltration uh, pond. We actually had used uh, four different treatments that we were testing. One was infiltration trenches, uh, where we just cut uh, about two foot deep rock trenches and filled them with rock. So we get water to try to infiltrate down deeper into the clay layers. Uh, you can kind of get an idea of what that looked like with bull rock in 57. And then, uh, and then we did uh, amended soils where we just cut 12 inches and just use sand and organics to amend the soils. See what those look like. And then the last one we did uh, before I show you the control was we used EGRP and EGRP is also called Parjana. And basically what Parjana is, is a series of small tubes that get drilled into the ground uh, to create a, um, basically what it does is it disconnects the soil layers so you, you relieve the hydrostatic pressure so the infiltration rates will move faster through the soils. Uh, it's really an interesting technology. And if you wanna talk more about it, if you're interested in it, I don't have a ton of time to go into it today, but it's something we'd be happy to talk to you about more uh, in the future. Uh, if you're looking at areas where you try to get water to disappear. Uh, it purports to, to, uh, to, it purports to basically make water move through clay soil seven to 10 times faster than it would uh, naturally. I messed up your controls because I was yeah, checking. You did. What did you do to me there? You got to click up. There you go. Sorry about that. There we go. So here you can see the, the, te the testing uh, apparatuses that are being used. And uh, unfortunately, in a place like Houston, after a year, we've only had one storm that's actually put water over these systems. 
Uh, all, all of our hurricanes and tropical storms went to, to Louisiana this year, which I'm not complaining too much about other than the fact that I didn't get to test my, uh, my pond as often as I would like to. I've only got, only got one uh, uh, sample plot, and that was during Tropical Storm Beta. So some of our goals on this were to test multiple infiltration methods and, and really improve these type C and D soils. Uh, you know, try to go from 0.5 inches an hour up to a five inch an hour uh, infiltration, um, which really is, it could be a game changer in places where a lot of flooding happens. Um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is, you know, okay, so that's cool. We can manage the, we can manage the two year with these things, but could we also automate hydrology of a site and decrease the size of a detention pond uh, through these automated controls. And we're working on the engineering on this right now uh, where we take this weir and we drop it because with these weirs, they have transducers and they have gate sensors where we always know the elevation of the gate. And we always know how deep the pond is. So if I know those two things, I know how much, how much head I can put over my weir. And I know what the flow rate through my weir is, uh, which would allow me to basically never allow my flows to exceed whatever storm event is occurring at the moment. So if my rain gauge is telling me that the water's coming down at a uh, intensity that equals a hundred year event, well then I just tip my bucket so that the head over the weir doesn't exceed my hundred year event. And through this automated manipulation, our ponds shrink drastically because we're no longer using a passive weir, we're using an active weir. Uh, and there's a couple of companies around the country that are that are proving this model up and are having some success with it. And it's in the weirdest places like Mississippi and Alabama, places you would never expect this type of innovation to come out of. But it is. It's pretty neat stuff. Um, so you could really kind of change this hydrograph where maybe you're whole, maybe you're releasing your water for the 12, the first 12 hours. And then you start to capture uh, after 12 hours once the peak starts to intensify. Uh, or maybe you're just drawing it out over a longer period of time, or maybe you want to capture until the peak and then you want to release the peak, or you, you want to, you know, actually you release until the, the big storm comes and then you completely turn the bucket up and you hold the water after. Um, there's just a lot of different ways we can manipulate the hydrology with this, with these automated systems and create uh, uh, automated commands. Some other uses, uh, detention bases, uh, we can use them in uh, volume management, these batch detention we talked about, uh, you know, creating groundwater infiltration basins so we can hold the water and allow the water to, to uh, infiltrate for, you know, maybe a day or two and then release. We can combine them with green infrastructure to make the green infrastructure work better, uh, but not hold the water too long. Um, there's just a lot of really neat stuff we can do with this. And even emergency situations, we can, there's so many sensors we can put on these things. So you can put hydrocarbon sensors. So if you have it in a right of way or in a center median, like a roadway project, and there's a, there's a fuel tank spill, it'll sense hydrocarbons and shut the valve and will capture all that fuel, uh, from any entering our, uh, our streams. There's just a lot of really innovative stuff we can do with this. And, and we're really just scratching the surface as it relates to, uh, smart technology. So with that, I'm uh, seven minutes early and uh, we can open it up for a few questions or if uh, Bill has some closing remarks. Did I lose you, Bill? Yeah, I muted myself. <laughs> oh, that was the first so, time I ever heard you silent. Oh, that's hilarious. So I took over the <laughs> control. Sorry about that. That's funny. Um, I took over the controls. I'm not sure if you can see the questions on my screen, but the uh, question from Michael Sharp is, what is the preferred method to getting water into the spaces, like in those recessed medians? Do you drop the curb over long distance and sheet flow or have multiple curb cuts, drop structures like rain guardians and rain bunkers? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So it depends, right? So um, in Houston, I'm flat. Uh, so we, we don't have a lot of sheet drainage uh, to, to help us. Uh, so what, we're, what we use a lot of, are, uh, we call them false back inlets. So imagine a curb inlet top with no back and a, a concrete flume. So they, the county wanted a standard curb. They didn't like the idea of a salt uh, cut tooth curb because they were afraid, you know, car tires would hit them and flip. I don't know if that's ever happened, but it's something they were concerned with. So they have a, a continuous curb like you'd see on any, uh, any boulevard. Uh, and then the water just goes into what normally looks like a curb inlet, but uh, discharges uh, into a false back that either has riprap on the backside or it has uh, something like a flexa mat or it uh, just has a concrete flume that takes the water to the bottom of the, of the, the swale. 
and um, but you can that, sheet flow. There's a thousand different ways you can get the water in there. And that's what I would say. So I just finished helping uh, oversee the construction of several uh, focal point bioretention systems in the street right away, right behind the back of curb for the city of Des Moines, Iowa. And it was their first project where they managed a watershed using focal points. And at every focal point, we have a rain guardian turret that empties onto just a really small section of Fleximat that takes the energy off of the overflow of the turret. So the turret is the curbside pretreatment that they can clean out. And Michael, I can share that information with you because I know you and have your contact info and I'll even share pictures with you. So stay tuned uh, to our newsletters. We're updating project profiles on that. And then I'm sharing information on LinkedIn as well, just like David said he would. So David, when you share yours on LinkedIn for that project you mentioned, I will share that as well with uh, my people. And then I'll also uh, let you know when I share the um, project case study for the focal points we did in Des Moines. Um, Pam has a question in KC. Uh, David, from your experience, who's responsible for the maintenance of these active systems and what happens if there is a malfunction? Yeah, so I, I've, got, I've got a unique situation in, in, in specifically Texas or Houston and Harris County. They have what's called a, storm, a, a pretty good stormwater quality management program. And what that means is that if you pull a permit in city of Houston or Harris County uh, on any project that's over an acre, you have to have what's called a stormwater quality management plan. And what that means is that on a monthly basis, you either hire somebody or you go out and you do an active inspection on the system and you sign off on the fact that this system is working as it should. And then on an annual basis, you have to hire a licensed professional engineer to come out and inspect your system to make sure that it's working properly uh, in order to get a permit renewal. Um, the good news about that is that most of the systems in the region that I work in uh, get maintained because companies, co maintenance companies sprout up to basically meet the need of, uh, of that industry. And so like our company, for example, we supply maintenance on uh, almost 550 properties in the Houston area for their stormwater quality. And that goes for everything, bioretention, permeable pavers, uh, hydrodynamic separators, underground detention systems, you maintain it, you maintain it all. Uh, so that really kind of kind of puts all the onus onto whoever the property owner is. Um, most of the time, that could be that could be an individual property owner, uh, like uh, like a building owner. It could be a, a homeowners association. Uh, it, we have what are called multiple utility districts, which act like small cities uh, here in Houston as well. They call them MUDs. Um, but generally, it's going to be on some sort of uh, management district or HOA or uh, something along those lines. Uh, rarely. Does it go back on the city or county unless it's a county or city project and then their parks department maintains it or uh, one of the things that we realized we had to do with Harris County uh, right now there's probably 16 roadways that have gone this route because they found it to be cheaper than doing traditional design um, they uh, they actually pulled a separate contract an annual maintenance contract on all green infrastructure projects so um, they take care of it themselves uh, through that program well, good answer, David. Thank you for being thorough. So we are up against the one hour timeline. So I'm going to take a picture of a couple more of these questions and I'll get back to everyone. So all the questions that were not answered live here today, I will answer in writing when we respond to everyone. And I'll provide some of the information that some of you have asked, like case study, my case study on the focal point and some of the smart pond information. So thank you for that, David. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to the next slide. We have about a minute left. So Folks, look for the survey monkey that our marketing department, Mad Madeline Dreary, will send out. It'll either come from Madeline or from Don Tiemann's email address. And we'll have a survey monkey for all of you attendees. And that's just going to confirm your name, your email address, your company name. We'll send you your PDH certificate. And we'll also share the written answers to all the questions that were asked today, even the ones we did answer live. Um, David, thank you very much. Uh, folks, we're going to take next Wednesday off so that people can go celebrate their families. I hope that... Uh, Everybody stays healthy and safe, and we'll come back in December for three more webinars. We'll take two weeks off for those holidays, and we'll be back in January. So, David, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You bet.